all. Um, if you were here at the end of the last service, I started introducing where last week we finished the book of Colossians. Um, now, when you do a book like that, it's always uh, of a scale, a continuum of how in-depth do you go. On one hand, I bet there are seminary courses that take months on the book of Colossians. I bet there's also people who would do it like, hey, here's one session. And so I try to do a, a kind of a, a reader's view of it with a couple points that we apply and go in. So we did that in about four or five weeks. We're going to take five weeks now and probably cover some material that you have covered before. If I said, hey, we're going to talk about the Reformation, you might immediately know some stuff. You might go, ooh, 95 theses. You might know uh, um, an instigating monk by the name of Martin Luther. You might know ooh, uh, chapel doors. You might know Wittenberg or this kind of stuff. This one has a different aspect. This one is aimed at what was the individual's experience? It's going to kind of look specifically at Martin Luther and say, feel the wrestle within that. He's in a world in which all the powers are in alignment, and he's going to go, what if, what if things are wrong? I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where you kind of go, I'm feeling conviction to call out something that a lot of things are aligned against me. Right? And uh, will you do that? If you'll do that, how you'll do that, and how you'll carry it off, but to kind of speak truth to power. Uh, and if you look at it in, in the um, realm of history, uh, do you remember right at the, at the time of 2000, they were saying all the top 10 lists, most influential things, not in the last year or the last century or the last millennium, Luther shows up as one of the transformative voices of the millennium. Uh, because there's multiple things that happen there. He's one of the first things that starts flattening some authority structures, right? And, and we take for granted today that we can speak truth to power. That did not exist in Luther's day. If you, you quote, spoke truth to power in his day, there was a chance you didn't get to finish your sentence, all right, so uh, we'll, we'll walk into that, but that's the unique flair of what we're looking at today. Let's start with this brief stirring discussion question. Take a moment and just kind of go, if I had a one-word adjective for your faith, right? You, you have to kind of start processing that. A, an adjective for your faith could be any number of things. Strong, weak, deliberative, discerning, um, wayward, intentional, deep, shallow, all that kind of stuff. There could be any number of things, but I bet your faith has probably changed over the years. Today, and this is a question you probably don't ask a lot, so you're kind of going, I am not sure what kind of adjective to put here. This is not something I really think about, and I want to go, cool, welcome to church. We do think about that stuff a lot around here. An adjective you would give for your faith today, and it might be hopeful, joyful, uh, longing, uh, uh, on the other side, despairing, difficult, challenging, but then also now think by the decades. Ten years ago, how was my faith different ten years ago? It might have been different regarding the, the ages and stages of your kids, your marriage, your health. Was there something going on ten years ago? Twenty years ago, I was going to be confident enough looking around this room that there might be a 30-year track. But it turns out as I look at this room, at times we could kind of go 50 years ago. <laughs> but I'm going to give it, just give it a, a little bit of time here and pick some adjectives. Uh, in a couple minutes, I'm just going to say, let's share a couple of the words you described. You don't have to give me the whole story, but let's just kind of give some of the words we're doing. Take a moment, write a, a one word or hyphenated word, we could go with that too, of your faith today and then by the decades, 10, 20, 30 years ago. If you get it quickly, compare your notes with someone around you. 
Why did you put the word you did? Why did they put that word? All right, inevitably in this room, there's someone who's having a hard time coming up with adjectives. What are just some of the different adjectives you use? You don't have to tell the story, just kind of go, here's one of the words. What's one of your words? Devoted. Okay, devoted. That could be a good word. Growing, Growing, that's good. What's one word you put? Faithful. Faithful, similar to devoted, like I got that. Uh, Growing is? Reassured. Reassured, reassuring or something like that. Cool, someone over here. What's one of the adjectives? Say again? Hectic. Hectic. That's interesting. Enduring. Enduring. That's good. Accepting. Accepting, right? And some of these, I bet if we take these words and we start unpacking them, I bet there's stories that go with these words, right? Um, Now, let me tell you why I start like that. We start with this because to reflect upon what is the the quality, caliber, trajectory, kind of uh, direction of my faith starts putting you in the frame of mind where you can start identifying with some of the wrestle that Luther and other Christians were having in his day. Um, You know why you know the name of Martin Luther? Because he was the one who lived to be able to tell his story. There were other reformers who were raising questions before him. It's just they ended up tied to a pole, you know, on a stake, uh, at various t- things like that. All right, I'll, I'm going to show you a couple videos here today. Um, this is a video by Lutheran Hour Ministries that kind of says, here's part of the profile. Now, in Luther's day, let's just start with this. School, home, and church, there's one thing they all have in common. They're all very, very, anybody got to guess what word goes in there? Strict is exactly right. In that day, there's clearly defined roles and tiers and all this kind of stuff, right? You might have grown up in a strict household, probably not totally like Luther's day. The the rigidity of a lot of things in these households was uh, not just strict, but it actually might have leaned towards harsh um, on that. And now... The faith life in those days, people worshipped without knowing what they were saying or doing. We could briefly cash that out. Um, Why weren't they able to know what they were doing when they were in worship? Any quick guesses on that? Because it wasn't in their language, right? Uh, Can you imagine? So you you come to church here today. Um, Let's see. Pastors, we have to learn a little bit of Greek and Hebrew, right? I learned a little bit of Latin. Can you imagine, you come to church here today, and I'm going, we're going to have authentic worship here today. We're going to do it in the language of the New Testament, and I do everything in Greek. Just pause for a moment and think what your worship experience is like, right? I bet you knew, you could tell a lot of, there's there's something holy going on up there, right? And you could tell it by the, um, what sometimes in seminary you call chancel prancing, right? It's, it's the directions, it's bowing, facing this, it's doing that. And you know there's responses, everyone at this point, amen, and you would do it. You'd go like, okay. And there were no cell phones in those days, so you can't like be checking your cell phone and doing all that stuff. But you wouldn't not go to church, because if you didn't go to church, you were fearing What? You're fearing hell. You're kind of go and you're fearing hell because you live in a world where death is all around you. Right? Infants, infant mortality, high. Mothers dying in childbirth, high. Longevity of life? Uh, shoot, in our country, before penicillin, you want to know what the average length of life was? 47. That's younger than me. I'm looking at them going. I, before penicillin, I am an old, old man. If I asked my kids nowadays, they would go, go, Dad, 
you're already an old, old man, right? Now, take that back and imagine in Luther's day where infectious diseases are running rampant, hand washing, what's that? All this kind of stuff going on there. Um, so you would go to church because you're like, death is all around me, and if I meet my maker next week, I want to be ready. Because you knew people who were just fine, you know, last Sunday, and this Sunday, ah, so-and-so died. You got to go, it happens. All right? Now, uh, that, oh, I guess I was already ahead of myself. Death is a pervasive reality. Um, and it turns out, the death of a loved one, or facing your own, makes you ask different questions of faith every single time. All right, so that's where we're at. Let's kind of check out a video, and this will be our first of our two videos today. And nearly 500 years ago, an unknown monk from a backwater town in Germany, he set in motion a movement that would literally transform Western civilization. His name was Martin Luther. You know, I love what he said. He said, I never thought such a storm would rise out of Rome over a simple scrap of paper, but it did. Because he set free the gospel of Jesus Christ, a gospel that had been held captive for nearly 1,200 years by a church and by a book. Five hundred years ago, the people of Europe were under the domination of a, a very powerful religious empire, the Roman Catholic Church of the 16th century, an empire that controlled every aspect of a person's life. Uh, it could raise you to glory or condemn you as a heretic and burn you alive. So the church at that time had evolved or grown into this institution which was quite intimidating for the average person. The entire mass was done in Latin and the people didn't really know what was going on. They had memorized parts of it without really understanding what the parts meant. They just knew this was big, important, special stuff. But actually understanding what was being said, not really. Books were still rare. You could have an entire church that might not have an actual Bible in it. You would have maybe outtakes and little parts of it, but a full Bible was, was not common. Death is something people encounter all the time. To get through infancy was a significant accomplishment. People spend a lot more time thinking about what's next, and it was not a happy thought for most people. Martin Luther was the son of Hans and Margareta Luther. He was born November 10th, 1483. He was baptized the very next day. Children were baptized as soon as possible after birth because you just didn't know if a child was going to live. Infant mortality rates were huge in those days. And he ends up being named Martin Luther because he's baptized on St. Martin's Day. Uh, Hans had been a minor. Uh, he became an entrepreneur when Luther was very young. So Hans had dreams of not only moving from the agricultural peasantry into the mining industry, he had dreams of moving his son into the bureaucracy, where there was more money, more security, more power. And so he had a, a vision for the Luther family that, that was on the move, upward and onward. There was no such thing as social security in those days your social security policy or your insurance policy for your old age, as it were, was your children, specifically your sons. And so Hans had big ambitions for his second son, Martin. He had designs on making him into a lawyer. The Luther family moved from Eisleben to Mansfeld, and Martin Luther went to elementary school here and primarily was a Latin school. And later, Luther would record the fact that in one morning he was caned or disciplined somehow 15 times for not having prepared his Latin lesson correctly. You know, people sometimes have these rather um, nostalgic, you know, views of, oh, wouldn't it have been great to live in the 16th century? You know, life was hard then. Even the attitudes of society were, were very difficult and, and, and rather harsh. 
Everything in those days was pretty strict in terms of the upbringing of young people. The church was strict. His parents were very strict. As a matter of fact, Luther later said that his concept of God the Father was somewhat influenced by the fact that his own father was very strict and he wasn't sure how much he loved his father at that point after getting disciplined. For small offenses in the civil realm, there would be rather harsh punishments. And this is part of what Luther grew up with. He, he recollects as he got older, you know, being punished by his parents sometimes for stealing a nut. And he said the blood flo flowed from the punishment he got. And the same thing he would experience in the schools. Just, it was, it was a harsh sort of world. The image they had of Christ was the image from the, from the apocalypse of St. John. Christ in, in glory, and Christ in judgment. And coming from his mouth would be the lily on the one hand, and the sword on the other hand, and the lily of God's mercy and God's forgiveness, but the sword of wrath and judgment. So the burning question was, how do I avoid the sword and get the lily? Well, the church had the answer for this. And the answer, interestingly enough, came down to something you could put in the form of a slogan, which was actually preached from pulpits. Do what is in you. Do what is in you and God will not refuse you grace. At least do the best you can. So God gives his grace and I use that grace and I accomplish what God wants me to do. But what happens if I mess up? Well, there's an answer for that too. I go to church and at church, I would meet the priest one-on-one -on -one and I would confess to him. And that would open the rite of penance, which would be I confess and then he gives me some kind of satisfaction to perform, something that needs to be done to show that I have a truly penitent heart. It might be a Hail Mary, it might be a more rigorous kind of action, or it might be a suggestion that I could give a donation to a certain cause. And if I would go and do penance, then I could be assured I was forgiven for that particular sin. So it was very, very carefully worked out system. This amount of sin, this amount of penance, everything's right again, you're back on track and away you go. Now, what if I don't do enough penance? What if I don't quite cover all the sin? The answer is some time in purgatory. And so you die, you're not quite good enough for God yet, but you're on the right track. We're not gonna send you to hell, that wouldn't be right, but you can go to purgatory and in purgatory, we'll get you cleaned up or God will get you cleaned up. So purgatory is not pleasant. You're, you're suffering in purgatory. You're sweating off your sins. And so I finished paying for all of my sinful behavior. And when I finally have paid every last bit in purgatory, then, then I'm ready now for the next step. And then I can walk into God's presence. But it was a very careful system. And all the way along, it's God's grace that's making this happen. And it's you that's doing it. You're the one earning the forgiveness. You're the one paying the price. You're the one accomplishing it. So the, the onus is on you to make sure it gets done. Now, this was the religion that Luther grew up with. And after he completed what we would call high school, he was recommended for the University of Erfurt. Luther received his bachelor's degree after about a year of study at the University of Erfurt. And then after about another two and a half, almost three years, he gets his master's degree. And now the master's degree was kind of a general purpose degree. It wasn't in a particular subject yet, but it enabled somebody who wanted to go on in higher education to move on to one of the higher faculties, which were only three in those days, medicine, law, or theology. But something is going on in Luther's life. While he's studying at the University of Erfurt, he noticed a great bound copy of an old book in the library, and it turned out to be the Holy Bible in the Vulgate Latin translation. Uh, he had heard readings from the Bible before, but never realized they all even came from the same book, because in those days, the Bible was regarded as a very dark and obscure document, which only the clergy could properly interpret. Now remember, Luther is born right at the advent of the printing press's discovery, but it was still in its infancy and b books were still rare. If you had a book, it meant somebody had to hand copy that book. And so Bibles, they're very expensive because you had to copy every single line of every single Bible by hand. But in Luther's time growing up, there were, there were Bibles that were very rarely found. Luther was very much aware as were all Christians at the time, that the church said, now you need our help in order to be able to understand this. You need guidance, expert guidance, to interpret this very mysterious book. But there were other events in Luther's life that focused his attention on the hereafter. In 1503, he was paying a visit to his parents, 
leaving Erford and going back to where they were. And he sustained a, an injury from a sword that pierced an artery going into his leg. Uh, and bled profusely, uh, which uh, was a very frightening occurrence for him. Uh, it reinforced a fear of death. Uh, I say reinforced because fear of death was very, very widespread at that time. You have to remember that death could come very suddenly. You could get sick in the morning and be dead by evening from some sort of bug. Uh, plagues regularly went through cities. Uh, women died in childbirth. Uh, death was much more a part of the daily consciousness in that time than it is now. And so when Luther accidentally stabbed himself, it was simply reinforcing a fear of death that was already there. Luther did recover, but there were other occasions in which uh, a friend of his named Alexis, for example, died. And Luther again wondered, what if I were Alexis? Uh, two of his colleagues in Erfurt died of the plague at the time. And so here this young student was looking way ahead into the future and the life to come early on in life. On July 2nd, 1505, Luther's coming back from visiting his parents, back on his way to Erfurt. He's only been in law school for, oh, about six weeks or so. Not very long by the time he took his leave of absence. And there's a thunderstorm that comes up. He is frightened for his life standing out there and the lightning and the thunder. He cries out, Saint Anne, help me, I will become a monk. And as somebody once said, well, she did. And he did. And it was goodbye to law school. About two weeks after that great experience at the thunderstorm, Luther basically dispossesses himself of all of his possessions, including a very expensive law book that his dad had gotten him as a graduation present for his master's degree graduation, and goes into the toughest monastery he can find there in Erfurt, that of the observant Augustinians. He entered an Augustinian monastery uh, and uh, did indeed uh, take a vow, which he later admitted was uh, made under duress and uh, was not sincere, but it was a vow that he took and he felt he needed to complete. And late medieval people were very concerned with their destination after death, and Martin Luther shared that concern. And so his decision to enter a monastery was motivated, at least in part, by this concern for what would happen to him after he died. And he believed, as was common at that time, and as the church encouraged, that going to a monastery, becoming a monk, would give him a better chance, a better chance of a happy result after he died. You know, obsessed by guilt and the fear of damnation, Luther was trying in vain to find assurance of his salvation. I, I love what he said. He said, I was a pious monk. You know, if ever there was a monk that got into heaven over monkery, I would have gotten there. So as Luther was entering into manhood, he was, he was literally running away from the world, um, hiding in the monasteries, trying to find peace with God. But the book, the book that he found in the University of Erfurt, at first it would torment him, but later it would bring him to the realization that would change the world. All right, we'll do a little bit of two-week continue with that. Let's first just kind of capture what was the religious system of the day, right? So one of the phrases that you're given in those days is, do what is in you. And we kind of say, well, what, did, what was the application of that? The bottom of line of that meant you should always do your, do your best, right? And if you do your best, God's got to accept that. I mean, what could more could he ask than to do your best, right? That was a little bit of it. Now, Let's just say there was a time in which you didn't do your best and you messed up. Then, well, if you messed up and you sinned, the prescription then was go see who? Go see the priest. Cool. All right? Go see the priest. Now, then the priest says, here, I'm going to assign satisfaction, right? Here's the things you should do. X number of Hail Marys, this kind of prayer, this kind of gift, um, clean this, do that, donate here, there. If a priest gave you that assignment, what is the next step? You, you do it, right? 
And I can, well, let me, I'll, I'll, I'll opine on that for a second later. Uh, let's go here then. So now let's say this. You doing all that satisfaction stuff, it doesn't quite cover it. Um, you weren't able to eradicate all of your sin in this lifetime. There was a theological system for that. And then said, now if you can't get it paid for in this lifetime, where could you pay for it? Purgatory, right? Last year we talked about how some of these doctrines, uh, the, the theological wranglings to justify them. So understand, we think of purgatory as like a place of suffering. It was marketed at that time as a mercy. Can't pay for it all in this lifetime? Your merciful God gives you another chance. You'd be like, oh, thank goodness. I, I don't have to go straight to hell. I just get to sweat it off in purgatory for a while, right? It was marketed as a, uh, a mercy. We'll extend the terms of your contract, all right? And in those days, if you kind of go, I'm confident of my salvation, that was seen as a cockiness, a sin. Who do you think you are? Do you have the very judgment of God? Because you'd be putting yourself in the place of like either the clergy or a bishop or, you know, even the pope. That's the person who renders verdicts, not you. Now, I'm stating this as if this is past tense. I would say we still have this mindset today. I, I've been a pastor for, what year is it, 2024? For just about a quarter century, not quite, all right? I have had a handful of times in my ministry where someone messes up. Hey, they, they got in an accident. The accident was a little bit alcohol-fueled or, um, you know, uh, a mom got mad, hit her wife. Hit her, uh, hit, hit her husband, uh, hit her kids, or something like that. I've had multiple times that people then, it, it's a strain. It, it like smacks you, you kind of go, oh gosh, I can't believe my life has come to this. More than a couple times in my ministry have I had people that said, Pastor, I feel so bad. What could I do? I'll do anything. Can I make a donation? I, I know you guys are trying to, to put on that wing here or do this, Right? More than a few times, someone said, here, you know what, will this do it? Check for $10,000 I had in my hand once. And I went, wait, what, what? Right? But can you empathize with where that person was coming from? I, I want to do something to make up for it. Now, if you are the clergy in those days, someone really messes up. Well, let me put it this way. Um, could St. Paul use more Sunday school teachers? Yeah. Can you imagine the temptation to kind of go, boy, I really messed up. You know, we got just a spot for you. Three weeks. Three weeks in the kindergarten classroom. There you go. And you know what it does? The person's like, yes, I wanted to do something to make up for my wrong, and we got the kindergarten classroom covered for almost a month. Right? Can you see how this system gains momentum on its own? Um, and if you're like, you know, could a church often use $10,000? Yeah, you're tempted to kind of go, I mean, if this is what the Lord laid on your heart to do, I'll take your guilt trip money. I didn't, right? <laughs> that kind of thing. But can you see how it's like, hmm, pastor could use a new car or whatever it would be, all right? Now, I would also say... We do this in the civic realm all the time. What happens when you have um, some, uh, some movie star, right? A guy who's a husband, he projects his marketing firm, his manager, look, he's the all-American movie star. And then all of a sudden you realize he was sleeping with the nanny. You're like, oh, well, what's the penance that happens in contemporary society? What does he have to do? Uh, I'm sorry, um, an interview with Barbara Walters, right? That used to be back in the day. I don't know who that would be nowadays. Um, and then the public will decide, did they look sorry enough? Sometimes they're able to project the right kind of sorriness, and we kind of go, okay, you can continue to make movies. But depending on their fault, so who are the actors who have been in purgatory? I pick them. Right? Uh, right now, you know what's happening right now? Will Smith is coming out of his penance. 
right? He did some weird stuff, and we're like, okay, you can make movies again. Did you go to a drug and alcohol center? Did you do the interview? Did you find yourself in Tibet or whatever, right? This is, here's why I say this. These things actually are, cert there's a certain logic to all of them. And we still, uh, according to our own fallen nature, we still try to follow this path. What can I do to fix what I did wrong? And if there's some uh, uh, religious authority that can help clear my conscience and set me down this path, I'll do it. Because in a fearful realm, you follow whoever projects to have solutions. Make reference to political elections right here. You're fearful, feeling insecure? Vote here. Do this, right? This person will solve it for you. Right? There's all kinds of stuff on that. All right, so let's go on there. Now, here's however the problem. When you open Scripture, Mark Dohler is going to read for me here. Would you read that passage? You have it. Just this one verse from Isaiah 64, verse 6. Read it, please, Mark. All of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts like filthy rags. We will shrivel like a leaf. And like the wind, our sins sweep us away. All right, so let's just kind of fill in this blank. So you're kind of going, hey, I think I'm paying for my sins, right? Because here's what we're about to turn the corner. Lutheran was a, Luther was a really good monk, like top of his class. But then he comes across verses like this. It says, I think I'm winning, I'm killing it. But then sometimes the Holy Spirit in us and God's revealed word had verses like this. How many of us are, are affected here? The first word is? All of us have become like one who is what? Unclean. You're like, ah, but I'm doing better than so-and-so. You're like, what are you doing? What? It, but we find comfort in comparing ourselves to someone who seems less, right? Becomes, and all of our righteous acts, he says they're like rags, but then it gives an adjective in there. All your righteous deeds are like what? Filthy rags, and the word for filthy there is not a polite Hebrew word, all right? So we're going on and we're doing all that stuff. Let's check out another video, because now Luther's going to go, what do I do with this? So Luther is now introduced to a monk's life, which is a very regimented thing in a lot of ways. There are worship services to attend, there are readings to hear, there's work to be done. Luther, of course, ramps that up. He not only wanted the strictest monastic discipline he could find, he disciplines himself, including self-flagellation. And, and he's at this for two years, just as a friar of the Augustinian order there in Erfurt. You know, being an Augustinian monk, it was hard. Your day started at 1.45 a.m. with a wake-up call and then 2 a.m. for a prayer service. Then you'd get another 30 minutes sleep and then have another service at 4 a.m. and another at 6 a.m. All that was before breakfast. And you were expected then to stay busy all day with work, with prayer, readings, and more church services until 1.45 p.m. Then they'd let you take a nap for a couple of hours and then you were back at it. Uh, the day, it was relentless. Luther at this point was uh, very concerned, of course, about uh, his salvation. And despite the fact that he was in a monastery, he never felt the security he thought he would find as a monk. In the monastery, instead of it solving his problems, it got worse and it got worse and worse because the more he tried to do things right and by the book, the more he realized he was falling short. In late medieval Christianity, there was a real bookkeeping mentality in regard to sins. Uh, sins were viewed as discrete acts or things that you had forgotten to do. And so you could list them off. What had you done or what had you not done that you were supposed to do? And under the late medieval theology of penance, you had to name everything. And while most people didn't take that so seriously, Martin took it extremely seriously and strove to name every possible sin that he had committed. Well, you can imagine uh, the result of this. Uh, Luther would name off his sins in the confessional, and he'd walk away and maybe remember a few more or maybe commit a few more, and he'd, he'd have to go right back. 
Uh, this frustrated his confessors. Uh, one of his confessors told him at one point, uh, go away and do something really serious, you know, a really big sin, and then come back and talk to me. Uh, he wasn't used to people having this level of, of scruples about every single aspect of their lives. All my brothers in the monastery who knew me will bear me out. If I had kept on any longer, I should have killed myself with vigils, prayers, readings, and other work. Martin Luther. So Luther is a good monk. He's serving as a monk, but he's not just an ordinary monk. He's got gifts and skills. And so he gets on the track to become a priest. And we need to remember, not, a lot of people assume that you know monks are all priests. Not at all. A monk is simply a, a man who's taken a vow of poverty and chastity, and he's living this way. But a priest is one who's trained to actually handle the sacrament and deliver the goods. Not every monk can do this. Luther was ordained in 1507. Uh, he had been selected for the priesthood, for the study of theology, recognized as a bright young monk and told to study. And at the moment of ordination, he experienced great fear. Uh, how could he possibly transform the bread and the wine into the body and blood of Christ? That, of course, was late medieval Roman Catholic theology, that the priest had the power to transform the bread and wine into the body and blood. And so when he knew he was doing the sacrament, when you said the words, hocus corpus melum, this is my body, you were holding the body of Christ. He was terrified to think that he, an ordinary human being, could be holding God in his hands. And he was, he was terror-stricken. It was, it was a very frightening moment for him. And he almost dropped the elements in, in his terror. Now, actually, that wasn't unusual. That happened to other young priests, too. But Martin remembered this. I've often wondered if it, if it played into his later rethinking of what was going on in the Lord's Supper. Because, of course, later on, when Luther thought about the Lord's Supper and God's gift to us in that, the focus was on what God is doing, not on what the priest is doing. Well, Luther survived his first Mass, and he, he was very successful at being a pious Augustinian monk. He didn't just go through the motions. He, he did his tasks earnestly, uh, especially mortification, which is self-torture, trying to prove to God that you really, truly are sorry for your sins. You know, he did things like he whipped himself, he walked over stone floors on his knees, he even laid out in the snow without covering himself. Staupitz had thought that if he'd get busy with his doctoral studies, uh, that would divert his mind from his conscientious struggle with, with God's wrath. It didn't quite happen that way. In some ways for Luther, going on to advanced study of the scriptures at the doctoral level made things even worse because now he's finding the righteousness of God a very narrow thing. God is righteous. He demands righteousness of his creatures. And Luther knew he couldn't come up with that. He felt that, that God was a tyrant, that God was a cruel monster who was demanding what could not be given and, and, and taking delight in damning him to hell. For Luther, in his day, righteousness of God meant the expectation that God has that you have to live a certain way. That means living without sin. That means doing penance for any failures I do have. And so for, for Luther, when he would contemplate the righteousness of God, this was not a happy thought, but a horrible burden because the righteousness of God, oh, that's perfection. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed through faith for faith. As it is written, the one who is righteous will live by faith. Romans 1, 17. Luther began his theological education shortly after his ordination. But in 1508, Johannes von Staupitz, who was the head of the Augustinian monastery, he summoned Luther to Wittenberg to fill in for a professor who was on leave. There, Luther lectured on Aristotle, and he also continued his own studies. Finally, in 1509, he earned his Bachelor of the Bible degree. After that, he then returned to Erfurt, and he lectured for two years. Within the um, Augustinian hermits of, of Germany, there was a, a dispute that arose, and the one party showed enough confidence in Luther to send him to Rome with a, a brother monk uh, to uh, plead their case uh, before the uh, head of the order and, uh, if necessary, before the Pope himself. He made his trip to Rome in the fall of 1510. Uh, visiting Rome was a great honor. It's a pilgrimage. 
And it surely would have knocked a lot of time off of uh, Luther's time in purgatory, this going to Rome, venerating the saints, and visiting all the holy sites there. On his journey, Luther and another monk, they stayed at the monasteries along the way. But one thing they noticed, the closer they got to Rome, the better the food got. In fact, the monks were living large. The much higher standard of living, the food was better. It was a lot different than the austere conditions Luther was used to back in Germany. Uh, and that already uh, began to make him wonder about uh, the, the level of devotion and piety in the church, since his was such a strict branch of the Augustinian order. And so he and a colleague then went over probably the Brenner Pass and came down the highway into Rome. And Luther says that the moment he saw holy Rome in the distance, he bowed down and kneeled in the roadway, so thrilled he was to see the city of God, as it were, on earth. But once he got into Rome and he was doing the various things that a religious pilgrim would do in Rome, he got less and less enchanted with the city of Rome. In fact, later on he said, boy, if, if there's a hell, Rome is built on it. He found a city full of venality and all kinds of corruption and hypocrisy. Uh, he, of course, did mass at all the great churches in Christendom there, and yet he was hurried along by other Italian priests who said, Passa, passa, get on with it, get on with it, uh, in all kinds of pagan magnificence. And he was so disappointed in this. Uh, Luther, who had been trembling at his first celebration of the Lord's Supper, when he was in Rome, he found uh, the priest saying, in the words of institution, bread thou art and bread thou shalt remain, wine thou art and wine thou shalt remain. Luther was deeply shocked by the casual mockery of the saints and the sacrament, everything that he held sacred. So the trip to Rome, it really didn't help him at all. And on his journey back to Erfurt then in 1511, Luther was more disillusioned and more concerned about his standing with God more than ever. And so he tried harder than ever now with countless hours of fasting and sleepless nights and in so many ways trying to work his way into God's favor and it didn't seem to work. Luther would confess his sins and then find himself grumbling against God moments later. And so he carried this problem to his confessor, Johann von Staupitz, and he claimed that uh, he almost hated God because of the things that he was being put through as a believer. Staupitz, however, let Luther in on a little secret. And what a comforting secret it was for Luther because Staupitz said that he himself had the same kind of spiritual wranglings that Luther did. Staupitz told Luther that repentance begins with the love of God. And at the time, Luther thought that that was really quite a, an enlightening thought. He said, so, what everybody else thinks is supposed to be the end of repentance is really the beginning. The beginning of repentance is that I love God, not for the sake of saving my own skin, but I love God for God's sake. Staupitz helped young Martin Luther enormously. Uh, he helped him to realize that his struggles with sin his struggles with what kind of God he had. Was it an angry God? Uh, but Staupitz didn't get Luther all the way to his Reformation breakthrough. Luther came to his Reformation breakthrough as a process and not as a single moment. On October 19, 1512, Luther received his Doctor of Sacred Theology degree in Wittenberg. At the ceremony, he pledged his submission to the authority of the church and to teach the truth of the Bible and to reject false doctrine. He became a professor of biblical studies. Now, in your lecture on the Bible in the Middle Ages, you don't actually do exegesis of the text and figure out what's going on. You're basically looking at what other commentators have said. Peter Lombard is the big one, and you're figuring out what he said about this, and you're making some further comments. But for Luther, he's digging in more and more because now he's got more sources available. He now has this new edition of the, the Greek text, and he's starting to learn this and dig into this. And as he's studying this, he's beginning to wrestle more and more with what actually is going on in the Bible text over against what he's been taught or what he's been learning through the church. But Luther would make a discovery. 
The Latin Vulgate was the official Bible of the church for over a thousand years. It, it was a translation of the Greek and Hebrew Bible into Latin by St. Jerome in 380 AD. Around Luther's time, there was a Dutch priest and a theologian named Erasmus, and he was able to organize a new testament, if you will, from the older Greek documents. And Luther was able to get his hands on one of these new, New Testaments. And as he was translating from the Greek, he discovered that the word repentance, metanoia, had been mistranslated by St. Jerome. So the Bible does certainly talk a lot about repentance and about metanoia or a change of mind or a turning, which is the, the Greek word for, for repentance. And so the Bible talks quite a bit about this, but the word penance doesn't appear in the Bible. The Greek word for repentance, metanoia, speaks of a, a basic change of attitude, moving us away from our sin in the direction of the gospel. When that was translated into Latin, it came out do penance. So doing the mechanics of confession to the priest and then carrying out the satisfactions for temporal punishments became the, the heart, really the only working definition of that term and the sense of our change of attitude got lost in the shuffle. Everything changes for Luther when he realizes it's not about me climbing up to God, but it's about God coming to me. And so what happens really in repentance is the focus is not about me doing my satisfaction, me earning my forgiveness, but it's about me simply honestly confessing to God and then hearing from God, you're forgiven. It was so, so liberating for Luther. Now one word might not seem that important, but listen to the difference. In Matthew 4, 17, it says, From that time on, Jesus began to preach, Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. The Vulgate says, From that time on, Jesus began to preach, Do penance, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Now that's a huge difference. And that means that the listing of all of your sins then, the making confession to a priest, and the doing penance for them, it's completely not biblical. By the middle of the 15 teens, Luther is beginning to say things in class, teach things in class based upon his own study of the scriptures that are different from what he had learned as a student. Although Luther had not yet fully grasped what he would eventually understand about the gospel, he had come to realize that righteousness uh, was not something that he himself would do, but that it was a gift that would be bestowed by God through faith. And this understanding uh, even though his theology was not yet fully developed, uh, would assist him and prepare him for the battles that he was about to fight. The Catholic Church many years later at the Council of Trent would double down on the doctrine of penance. In 1550 they declared, if anyone says that in the Catholic Church penance is not truly and properly a sacrament instituted by Christ the Lord for reconciling the faithful of God as often as they fall into sin after baptism, let him be anathema, that is, let him be damned. All right, in, in something that won't seem as a shocker to you, we're not quite going to get all my slide, through my slides today. Um, today, I want to do, I want to set the context. So let's just capture this here um, from the video. The church in Luther's day was doing big business. Uh, did anybody get the feeling watching that? Um, that Luther's attitude towards Rome might be somewhat akin towards our attitudes with like Washington DC nowadays. Where like, like ugh, I don't know if I really wanna know how all the sausage is made to use the metaphor. And you get closer, you're like, ew, okay. There's some things that are, that are mucky in the midst of that. Um, so, but it's, it's where the show's at. It's doing big business. So let's just kind of capture these things before we, we fully move on. They're waging prolonged, costly wars, right? And what do you know about wars? What do they cost the, the people who are leading the wars? They, they require a lot of? It's going to require some money, right? And so what's going on at that time? Um, in those days, it would said the Turks are threatening on the eastern front of the Holy Roman Empire. So you would kind of go, oh, okay, the, the, the Ottoman Empire that you might refer to, you're kind of going, okay, that's going on there, all right? And it, it takes a lot of money to keep 
the Muslim invaders at bay. That's what's happening. They're kind of going, it's a war for our souls. And truth be told, empires tended to run over one another and wipe out the, the peasants or the citizens because you were just, well, I would say cannon fodder. I don't know if they fully had cannons, but ever, otherwise, you, you were easily run overable, okay? Um, now, not only is that requiring a whole lot of money, there's also a few very large building projects going there. You been to Rome? You seen St. Peter's Cathedral? It is magnificent. It's jaw-dropping until you kind of go, wait a second, is this the context of how they funded that? What, on the, on the guilt-ridden backs of peasants? You're like, hmm, it becomes a little less sexy at that time. But it's still a really cool building, right? And the idea is, this is going to show the glory of the empire, right? Now, that's kind of a, church and state are exactly overlapped at these days, right? The, the whole idea that you, you and I have of separation of church and state, very, very uniquely American, right? Um, it's not a European history. It, it overlaps. The, the monarch gets to declare doctrine. The, the, you know, all that kind of stuff happens. The, the holy person gets to rule. All, this is just kind of how it happens. So, However, in these days, the church is very susceptible to corruption, right? Someone feels guilty, hands you a check for $10,000. I am, you're really tempted to go, oh, we could cash that check. That sure would be nice, all right? And they're just writing papal authority and human tradition and very little exposure to the Bible, in case you didn't catch that. Now, Human tradition, we don't immediately have a problem with that. You probably are heading into a season where you love some of your traditions. Great-grandma always used to make these Christmas cookies. Uh, we always go to this service. We always open presents at this time. Thanksgiving, we always make this, right? Tradition's cool. It anchors you to something bigger than yourself. But the moment you kind of go, this is doctrine, you kind of go, ooh, I got some problems here. So, um... Yep, and that's where we're going to pause for here today, <laughs> but there's a whole lot of, of to-be-continued pieces with that. Stay tuned. Next week, same bat time, same bat channel. Did anybody actually ever watch that show? Yeah, you guys would have watched that show. We'll resume. We'll continue there next week.